It's time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope? Larry Lesseur of the CBS television news staff and Kenneth Crawford, national affairs editor for Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Anchor Nelson, Administrator, Rural Electrification Administration. Mr. Nelson, here in a big city, uh, even the poor of the stuff take uh, electric light and power for granted, but how much of the United States is actually without it right now? About 9% of the farms in America are still without electricity. Well, we talk a lot about uh, aiding underdeveloped nations here on this program, and we've heard a lot about it in the United Nations, but how much would the electrification of the whole United States help us in building up markets here? Well, the electrification program has uh, provided a tremendous market for equipment of all kinds. It's been estimated that for every dollar spent in distribution lines, there has been four dollars spent in equipment and wiring and one thing or another. And in, addi in addition to that, uh, the productivity of agriculture has been enhanced because of the availability of electricity. Mr. Nelson, isn't it so too that uh, from now on, the ratio will probably increase because there is more equipment, air conditioning comes along, things of that kind. I, I believe that on farms you will find air conditioning moving into that field as well as in the city dwellings and in addition to that many other pieces of equipment as the farmers are able to buy them will be buying them as has been the practice in the past. You're a farmer in Minnesota, what kind of equipment do you have on your farm for example and what well, are you planning to get? How long have you had it? In uh, 1938, uh, we received electricity on our farm for the first time, and we have milking machines and uh, water system. I have electric welder in the shop, electric drills of all kinds. In the house, we have a deep freeze in the basement, hot water heater, and in the kitchen, all of the appliances that you will find in a modern city home. It makes farming a wonderful occupation. In addition to that, we have television. We enjoy your programs. Well, Mr. Nelson, uh, we've all, in driving through the country, seen poultry houses lighted at night, which is a most unusual sight, and I understand this is to help the production of, of eggs in uh, hens. But actually, if uh, electrification were uh, expanded throughout the United States, would it bring down the cost of farm production? I think it has already done that. Uh, I believe the cheapest help that we have on the farm is electricity. Without it, we would need uh, many more uh, men per farm, and without it, we would not have been able to produce through the emergency period in keeping with the demands that has been made on agriculture for more foodstuffs. Well, if this 9% could be electrified, would that uh, bring down some of the screams of the farmers right now about low prices on farm well, it'll production? Help. It always helps. Mr. Nelson, how big a role has rural electrification had in all of this? How many farms have been electrified as a result of the activities of this federal agency? About four million uh, farms have been electrified. Uh, the government has loaned about two billion seven hundred million dollars to these distribution systems, and it has been an extensive operation, one that no one ever realized would have uh, gone as far as it has. Uh, well, this uh, system has been in for 18 years now. What is the attitude of this administration towards the rural electrification administration and the use of cooperatives in producing and selling power? This administration has gone full speed ahead. We have a loan program that I think everyone must agree is adequate, and we have tried to set up an organization that will give more for the dollar uh, in our administration of rural electrification. We have reorganized our department and we have not thrown out uh, career people. We have picked the best ones that we have, put them in responsible positions, and they're doing a very good job for the farmers of America. How much have you cut down, Mr. Nelson, your pull? About 10 percent. We estimate we will save about three to four hundred thousand dollars of administrative costs, but we're going to do as good a job, maybe better, 
by having a little better and a little a more superior type of an organization, in my opinion. In, in all of this, uh, actually, the initiative is taken by, by the cooperative out in the field, is, is it not? That's right, and we're encouraging uh, the farmer to assume more and more of, his, of the responsibility of administration of mm -hmm. his own system because we believe, and I think everyone else recognizes, the future of our systems will depend on the wisdom of our own policy judgment back on the grassroots level. Well, Mr. Nelson, uh, we are told that Washington is uh, crawling, as they say, with power lobbyists. Don't you have some clashes with the uh, public utilities as to who shall produce and sell this power vis-a-vis well, your cooperatives? Uh, we haven't been bothered too much about that. Uh, we find that 50% uh, of the power that is used on our systems is purchased from utility companies. We think the big battle is pretty much over as to controversy about who should do what and we're trying to cultivate now an atmosphere of working uh, together because uh, we must do that to say that we cannot would be admitting defeat you're making some loans also are you not to telephone systems yes uh, we have clash there between private and public uh, some not too extensive about half of our loans have been made to private independent companies so it does demonstrate that we're working with both the cooperatives and the in independents in our systems well actually sir uh, how much uh, electro generation power is there in the United States left have we got enough here to supply all the places that you'd like to put it in I, I believe the supply of electric power is never has never been uh, adequately reached because the demand continues to grow you must build and build and I believe it will require the uh, resources of all of us to meet the demand because of the tremendous value of electricity Mr. Well, Nelson this 10 percent which you have not yet reached uh, is that hopeless or are you pressing into that uh, well area? we we don't think it's hopeless of course the areas that are not served at the present time are very uh, difficult areas to reach. Uh, they're not feasible as far as a loan is concerned and perhaps not exactly extensive farm operation areas and distances between farms is so great that the cost capital investment is so heavy that they're hard to reach. Where are these areas generally? Well there'll be some all over the United States. I think it's estimated for example in Kentucky at the present time there's about 40,000 farms that are unelectrified and that, of course, is quite extensive, and we need to do something about it. You do have the materials now, since the end of the war, to get this stuff out there? Oh, yes. There's adequate material available for all type of work. What is holding up the extension of uh, rural electrification right now, sir? I believe the only thing that holds up the completion of the job is the fact that under the terms of the Act, the REA Act, loans are to be made only to areas and to projects that are considered to be feasible or will repay to the government with interest. So when these loans are calculated, if it appears that the, there is not an adequate income there, the result of it would be that we couldn't, under the law, make the loan. But the projects, uh, many of them are so successful with existing systems, they're beginning to reach out and try to pick up some of these unserved farms. What's your experience on repayment, Mr. Nelson? Do you get this money back? Uh, so There's far, about a three the, billion dollar investment, I think you said. So far, the uh, experience in that respect has been very good. Uh, however, it must be admitted that uh, we have a five year period uh, to get our systems in shape before amortization payments come due. And it's evident that in some cases there will be projects in some difficulty, but we hope to help them uh, organize their administration so they can repay. But up to date, there's only two-tenths of one percent of delinquency as far as interest and amortization is concerned. Well, sir, do we have enough electric uh, generative power in the United States? Uh, do, have we harnessed every bit that there is of hydropower? Well, no. There's hydropower uh, still to be developed, and we hope uh, one of these days, there, there will be some cheaper means found, uh, perhaps in atomic energy. I see. Well, as a last question, I'd, I'd like to ask you, sir, do you feel that the uh, development of atomic energy for uh, peacetime uses will have a, a great benefit to the uh, rural areas of the United States? I think that in the field of, of generation of electric power, that atomic energy will someday be a blessing uh, to the country, 
And certainly, if we can get electricity at a cheaper uh, cost, there's no limit to how much we can use. Well, how far off do you think this is, sir? Well, I I've heard some estimate two years, some 10, some 20. I wouldn't know. I'm not an engineer, but my guess is that it would be from uh, 10 to 15 years. And you think this would bring down the price of food and uh, farm production all over the United States if this power could be extended to everywhere? Oh, very definitely. Well, what, in what particular way would it reduce costs? Well, for example, on the farm, uh, uh, we use it, as you mentioned, with our poultry. We use it with our milking machines. We grind feed. We might dry hay. We might dry grain. We might dry our corn. There'd be any number of things we could use it for if we could afford to buy it at the price that it's costing to generate it. It would be cheaper, won't it, when you can have lots of small atomic plants? I think so. Your transmission costs would be cut down because it's assumed that the capital investment in generation through atomic energy will be much lower. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nelson, for being here tonight and bringing us this interesting information. Happy to be here. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Kenneth Crawford. Our distinguished guest was Anchor Nelson, Administrator, Rural Electrification Administration. If you're contemplating the purchase of a very fine watch as a Christmas gift, it will be profitable to compare the facts you have about Longines watches with the facts you have about any other timepiece. And you'll find that the facts about Longines are convincing proof that in a Longines you have one of the world's very finest watches. In competition with the world's best watches, Longines watches have won, for excellence and elegance, 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals. For accuracy, highest honors from the leading government observatories. For dependability, a position of leadership in sports, aviation, and in science. Yet, although Longines is one of the very finest watches made anywhere in all the world, a Longines watch is not excessively expensive. For you may buy and proudly give a Longines watch this Christmas for as little as seventy-one fifty. And this is important. Whatever the price of the Longines watch you select, it is manufactured to the high standard of excellence which has made Longines the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored Christmas gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. There is only one Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by La Coultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by unfailing daily variations in the temperature of the air. Atmos, product of La Coultre, division of Longines Whitnor. This is the CBS Television Network.